Okay, so um, I did, initially when I was applying for Fulbright, I actually was going to do research in Egypt, but then the Egyptian program ended up getting cancelled, so before that happened, I decided to apply for ETA in Bahrain. Um, this is Bahrain, it's very small, it's located right there. You can't even actually see it on a map, it's just the star of its capital. Um, it's an island, but there is a bridge connecting it to Saudi Arabia, near Iran and the Arabian Gulf. Um, and I, as I said, I was an ETA, but I also did research. So as an ETA, you have the opportunity to do research. It's just you have the obligation to also be an English teaching assistant in these classrooms where you're assigned on an every day. But people's schedules vary. For example, mine, um, I was a native English speaking practice partner for the students. I taught at a medical school. I did English conversation groups where we talked about really whatever, cultural exchange, etc., and tutoring. I only worked 11 to 5, um, Sunday through Thursday, because their weekend is Friday, Saturday. And it was really nice. You get to meet students. You, um, I really enjoyed my experience because I felt I could do both the English teaching and the research. And through the English teaching, it was like a venue to meeting people and actually getting closer to the local culture than if you just arrived as a researcher, I personally felt. And benefits of why a person could choose an ETA versus research are, like I said, I felt that compared to the researchers I was with, I was able to interact with people on a daily basis with students, with their families, with my coworkers. And through those interactions, I was, for example, invited to people's homes and events, different things that as researchers arriving, they were much more, took a longer time for them to actually be integrated into the community. Um, and I think it is a different perspective of developing an understanding of that country that you're in because you're talking to students every day about their lives because you're an English speaking partner, so you just talk about anything that they feel like. So most of my students were from Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, but also Qatar and Kuwait. And, you know, some of my students were from villages where, like, their families raised camels or and they had 20 brothers and sisters and three moms, or not really moms, but their dad had three wives. So. It was really interesting to see it from their perspective, their own culture. And, um, and now Heather asked me to speak more to the application. I think that for ETA, you, if you're thinking of applying, you should look, try and highlight the experiences you have having taught English or tutored somebody or in any way were a mentor, even if it was like being a soccer coach somewhere, like anything where you were a leader guiding other people. I think it's really important to highlight those experiences. And um, I think that whether it's research or ETA, you should, because the point of Fulbright is cultural exchange. You want to really make it seem like you're doing this so you can learn about them and like their, the way they do things in their country and how that would be beneficial to you and also share your culture. As I said in the last point, you really don't want to sound like kind of a Christopher Columbus writing your application where you have some idea of why they should be taking your ideas or why English is important because, you know, we speak English so they should or your research idea would improve their country. Like your a focus of your application should be talking about the benefits of you going and learning from what they already have there. And I think because at the end of the day, like after it gets through the U.S. round, it goes to that country's round of applications. And if they're sitting there reading it and feel like you, you know, think you know better than them, I think it looks very bad. So, um, And in terms of the ETA positions, there are just some questions I think a person could think about while writing their essay. Like, what is the power of language? Why is English important in the world today? Why would it be relevant to those students in that country? Why you would be a good fit? Um, and how this applies to your future plans? I think that question is important, whether research or ETA. That, like, why is this country and this experience specifically relevant to your future? So, for example, if, like, when I applied to Bahrain, I talked about wanting to improve my Arabic because I wanted to work in international law and how I thought that English is important because it helps people, like how it would help people from their country learn to be able to share their culture and experiences with the rest of the world because it is that global medium of a language. So these are just some ideas to consider while writing your essay. Um, and these are just pictures of my trip. So I'll tell you about Bahrain. So a lot of people wear abaya there, but I mean, you don't have to. It's pretty free and liberal. Like you can wear whatever you want, but 
depending where I was working and teaching, because I volunteer in villages as well, I would wear it. Um, my research was on the human trafficking of South Asian laborers. Um, my family's Pakistani, and I um, was very interested in seeing the condition of South Asians living there. So I worked with Bangladeshi and Pakistani laborers, as well as domestic workers who ran away from their where they were supposed to be working because of abuse they experienced. So I interviewed them and worked with a local organization. So like I said, as ETA, you do have the opportunity to do research as long as you have the time. And some of that does depend on country, but we can... Oh, right. yeah, well... Yeah. For certain degrees, yes. <laughs> <We're fine. laughs> um, And as you just, you know, yeah. food and everything. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, and you get to really be a part of the... Bahrain's a very small country, and it's 52% non-local, so it's very diverse. So people were very open to bringing me into their community. And, like, this is during Muharram, and I got to be, like, witness processions and go to people's families' homes for their celebrations. Um, Sorry, I, oh, you're no, fine. it's okay. Sorry. And so these are just photos from there. And I was there during Ramadan, which is also a very special experience. And yeah, you get to really be a part of a community in a very special way through the Fulbright and experience things. Um, because for, depending on what country you go to and the kind of people you interact with, most countries have obviously various communities. So in Bahrain, I interacted with the Pakistani community, the Balochistani community of that, Iranians, and Bahrainis, of course, and Saudis. You get a really, it's an intensive experience, but it's wonderful and it's long enough that you can really get to know a place. And also, when you do the Fulbright, they give you some weeks that you can travel abroad to countries near you. So I went to Jordan and Oman. And yeah, so I really suggested, and I had an amazing experience. So good luck. And if you guys have any questions, that's my email. Like you can see it. You can send them to me or let me to read something. I can help you if you're interested. Finished. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, for Karen. Uh -huh. um, so how was your Arabic going in? And is that a useful skill? Well, obviously it's useful, but like, how useful is that? So how is, sorry, I have to repeat the question to the computer. So <laughs> how is my Arabic and was it useful? Um, well, in Bahrain and the Gulf, in general, most people speak English. So I wasn't using it as often as I thought. I mainly used it when I was actually interviewing the domestic workers because many of them have picked up Arabic because they've been placed in the Middle East. In terms of other countries, because every Fulbright group will have a conference once a year, and so it's regional. So I went to Jordan and met with all of the people from like Morocco, um, Jordan, Bahrain, there's another one. And so I think in countries like Jordan, it is much more useful. A lot of your students won't be speaking English. It's really, uh, people like if people are coming with Arabic interests to these countries. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the overall application, do you think it's like more useful to be able to have that language already kind of in your back pocket? Mm -hmm. Is um, it more useful to have the language? Yeah, is it more useful to have language? A lot of this depends on the country. So, in general, with Fulbright, um, obviously there are uh, opportunities available in many countries, and each individual country will kind of stipulate what level of language they expect you to have. So, for instance, if you're applying to um, a Spanish-speaking country, they actually require a rather high level of, of Spanish language skill, um, even for ETAs. Um, in many cases, really kind of the bare minimum is two years of, of, of college study, not just testing out for that, you know, in that example. Um, somebody applying to Spain for an academic grant, they actually have to submit their statement of grant purpose in Spanish also, in addition to the English. So that's a really heavy requirement. Certain other countries, if you apply, say, for an ETA um, to Thailand, they, they don't expect you to have it. They say it's helpful or, you know, maybe have like a basic level before you arrive. Like they expect you to have that basic hospitality level of the language, but it very much depends on which country. And they'll say it in the country summary. And I'll, I'm going to show a little bit about um, kind of navigating through the Fulbright website where some of that information is, but that's the short answer is it kind of depends on where you're going. Um, did you?
Yeah, I, I would say um, certainly depending on where you're going, um, it's it's never a hindrance. Um, yeah. It's it's always going to help, um, and in some cases it's uh, you know a, very much a boon to your application. Um, I would say it's more kind of putting you toward the top of the pack, and it also depends on what you're proposing to do. If you're, say, going to do um, research that's heavily interview based, then yes, the you know having the languages is probably going to be key and, and a must have. In certain other cases, it's just something that gives you an advantage to have the language. So, um, if you're interested in doing research in addition to the ETA, mm -hmm. do you have to specify that in your application, or is that something you do on the side? Um, so do you have to, if you're going to do research with an ETA, do you have to specify what you're doing? So um, um, you can probably talk about Well, about in fame. mine, they asked you to have an idea of what you wanted to research. Um, but really, a lot of the countries don't have oversight as much as others. For example, in Jordan, there's a lot of oversight in Bahrain, not so much. So also, like what you write in your application as your side project, you can change that when you get there. You're not bound to it, nor are you required to submit something regarding that project afterwards. But a lot of the countries do expect you to have an idea of something you would be interested in researching. And also, um, just in terms of a secondary project for ETAs, um, so all English, or I should say in most countries, English teaching assistants are expected to have this secondary project. Many times it takes the, force of, uh, the form of a small-scale research or independent yeah. study project, but it can be other things. It can be community service. Um, it can be um, doing volunteering of, of you know, something uh, that appeals to you that maybe you do here, you could carry it on over there. But it can also be things like, um, you know, if you coach a sport and you're going to go to a, um, you know, primary school or a secondary school to, to teach, maybe you offer to, to coach or help with extracurriculars. I mean, it, it can be a lot of different things. Um, some countries actually say that they specifically don't want you to do a secondary project. There are certain countries they say, hey, you know, you're here to teach you know, that should use up most of your time. You don't have to propose anything. So again, depends on the country, but um, the only real sticking point um, is that whatever you choose to do for your secondary project as an ETA, um, it can't be location specific within that country. So you'll choose your country you apply to, but then for ETAs, it's actually a placement. You don't get to say where you're going to go. You apply to the country and then they place you. Um, at a later date. So whatever you do for your secondary project it can't be dependent on you know having access to a particular um, resource in a particular location within um, the country. Could you repeat that? So when you apply to a country you can, so you get accepted to a country, let's say India, mm -hmm. but you don't get to pick where in so, so it depends on the type of grant. So with Fulbright, there are um, academic grants or research. It goes by a few different names. So like the academic grant, the full grant, the research grant, which is for study or research. And then the separate one is the English teaching assistantship or the ETA. Um, the ETA is the one that has the placement. For, for people doing research or um, academic grants, it's completely self-designed and you dictate where you're going to go within the country. And you kind of pitch it in your application. So it's just for ETAs that you don't have a say where you go within the country. Um, excuse me. Do you have to go as an ETA for Fulbright? Like, can you teach another subject you're interested in that might go uh, along with your research? Did you? Oh. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting, but for example, in Morocco, when they arrived there, I mean, I had it really easy compared to other ETAs. I only had these small group settings. It was already these students had English teachers, whereas, for example, the students in Morocco arrived and they were teaching 200 student lecture halls. They had them teaching communications, political science, pretty much what they majored in, in addition to doing English teaching things. So I think it's dependent on your placement, but... Some places yeah. it's much more just like really your native speakers. So in other places you can be placed as a full teacher. Wow. That happens. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, certainly there have been cases of people being able to, um, you know, branch out uh, and, and do things, again, like related to what you um, got your degree in. Um, certain countries will say that they're, you know, also looking for people like in particular fields. And... A lot of times they will say that they're going to do that, but my understanding is yeah. not always not that always it, sometimes you get it sprung. I think, in Morocco, I think we're surprised. But also, <laughs> like, you can do, even in the English teaching, you could do, like, a poetry club or something you aren't interested in and propose it and teach that if students are interested in doing it. So you have freedom. And about being placed, 
Um, when I applied to Bahrain, I was placed at a university, and then one week before I was supposed to go, the university, they dropped my placement. They just said, like, we can't host her anymore. So then you were sort of, I was in a limbo sort of for two months almost, waiting to be placed at another <coughs> university, and there aren't really promises, so that can happen with Fulbright, not that it's common, but if there's no, if it doesn't work out one place, there isn't necessarily a guarantee that you can go somewhere else. Also, no one applied to Kuwait last year, so oh. <laughs> suggest it. Take that into how, how consideration. Is, how long is the program? Ten months. Ten months. Yeah. And it can vary a bit, but yeah, nine to ten months is kind of the norm. Um, so when you were there, did you feel like pretty welcome? Yeah, I feel did you feel welcome? Yeah. Mm -hmm. People were really friendly. It was very easy to make friends, and Bahrain is because they have so many internationals there. It's really easy to get involved in the communities. And Used to it, but all the Fulbrighters I met said they had that experience of people being very friendly, opening up their homes to them. People are really welcoming. So, yeah, it was good. Do you plan on going back and working there? Or well, I actually, after I finished, I went to Turkey and then I went back to Bahrain for a month recently. Um, I think eventually I'm going to law school, and after that, I plan to go back to the Gulf to work. But a lot of the Fulbrighters stayed in their countries. Many of my friends in the Middle East stayed in Morocco and Jordan. So it's very common to continue in your country. And a lot of the Turkish Fulbrights stay in their country as well. Um, so just to give you um, a little more of the, the general information about the program, um, first I should say thank you for, oh. <laughs> for uh, fielding all the yeah, questions yeah. and for your presentation. Um, so. Here at U of M, um, we have a number of different resources available um, for hang on one second uh, for you, and we've we've kind of been developing these in C tools. Um, but basically, um, you can join our Fulbright resources site, or we can add you. Um, normally, I would go around and just go ahead and enter them today, but we have such a big group, I think that would probably take up the rest of the time we have. So um, maybe not, but. Um, so basically, you can join the site, go to C-Tools over in the membership tab in the left side, click, I think, Joinable Sites, and then do a search for Fulbright Resources, and you can just add yourself to it. Um, so what we have available here, we actually have a lot of stuff. So there are actually three kinds of grants, technically, um, the academic grant, the ETA, and then arts applicants, so performing creative and performing arts. Um, and some of the things we have, uh, they're listed under the different options. So here I've um, blown out the academic grant. There is a timeline checklist for each type of grant um, that you can go and access this. And this will give you a good overview of what you need to be doing when, what happens along the way. Um, and again, it's dependent on what kind of grant you're applying for and what you select. But this will give you a good sense of, of uh, where to go from here. So. That's kind of a start there thing. Um, and then the different pieces of the application uh, kind of build off of that. You can go through and access different resources about the different pieces of the application. So that's one thing. That's our C-Tools site. Um, file that away for later. Then on the actual Fulbright website, so the usfulbright.online.org, some of the um, resources that are available here um, that are particularly useful. Um, the application tips, again a lot of this stuff is linked uh, through the C-Tools uh, resources, but um, each individual type of application will have tips listed that you can then go and um, read through all of this information, um, you know, get a handle on it, get a sense of uh, what they have to say about it, what the official word is um, on it, uh, and you can see all the different pieces. Um, as far as benefits, what you get, um, you asked about it, so I want to make sure I cover it. Um, the short story is they pay for your uh, round trip airfare, uh, your travel to and from the country. Um, in some cases, there might be an orientation um, in country, possibly in DC. It just kind of depends on the program. Um, there will be a stipend or a living allowance. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they did it in your program, but some, in some cases they say you should have some of your own personal funds for the beginning of it until they get everything set up. And in other cases, it's kind of from the get-go, you'll have your stipend rolling in. Um, they will help you find housing, um, but 
maybe you can speak to how that sure. occurred. Yeah. Um, so for all the Fulbrighters in Bahrain, either they were given housing, like I had housing through the university, or they would give you a stipend for housing. Um, and also my money was given to me in something like four installments, but I had it before I left. But for example, in Turkey, they are actually paid by the university based okay. on the hours they're working. So it's actually like a job job. Whereas in Bahrain, they just gave it to you and you're just expected to actually do your job. I think that's more common, is just having it dispersed. Yeah. And every country's amount is different as well. And it might even vary within the country. You know, if you're in a rural area, you probably won't get as much as if you live in an urban area, for instance. Um, but there will be some money. You know, you will, will you make any money doing a Fulbright? No. But you should be able to live fairly, fairly comfortable, uh, comfortably and, um, you know, undertake everything you need to do. And you might even have a little bit extra for side trips, that sort of thing. Some people, yeah. they do really save money. Though. Yeah. I mean, I'm from the Gulf. A lot of the people, they were given more money than they needed because they like their university ended up providing housing, so they didn't have to pay for it. So I know people who like had like fifteen thousand dollars left over after their full by ten thousand mm. dollars. Wow. Yeah, there's some people who. So maybe it will make some money. <laughs> but versus like Jordan, they get, I think less than half of what people in the Gulf get, and all those people theirs was gone. But some yeah. of the people I knew from the Gulf really were penny pinching during their time there. Made it work and it ended up having like they paid us their nest egg. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so it sounds like maybe you could um, potentially make money depending on where you go. So, but the point is though is that you should be in good shape to undertake it. It, it won't put you in a, a bad situation financially. And um, also, um, you get uh, insurance, accident and sickness insurance, that sort of thing. Um, what else do I want to say about it? Um, let's see. You know, there are some other things that are covered depending on the country. Some some countries allow uh, dependents to accompany you, other ones don't, which I keep talking about it varies by country. So this this really is one of the first steps here is if you, you know particularly where you're going to go and you are completely sure of it, that's fine. In some cases, you may be trying to decide between a few different countries, especially if you're an ETA. You might be a little more on the fence between uh, various different countries. Um, but no matter where you choose to go, you need to have a good justification for why you've chosen that country, a good rationale for um, choosing the country. Um, yeah, you can go up and see that one. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, it's bring your daughter to work day, so I'm a little, <laughs> slightly a little uh, um, more distracted than I would normally be. Um, so, okay, countries, 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 countries. Have a good rationale for choosing the country that you choose. And you'll need to make that case, um, you know, in your application. Um, not just, uh, like if you're doing research, for instance, why do you need to do it there if it's something you can do here? Why specifically do you need to go to that country? And why that country over another country? So be thinking of making that case and persuading people that you need to go to that country to do what you need to do. Um, yes? Um, yeah. Yes. So, um, so affiliations. Uh, let me jump over here for just a second. Um, so affiliations basically are letters of support that you get from people in country that are going to provide some sort of support. And you can have multiple ones. You can have ones that like support each other. So maybe one from a faculty member that's going to kind of take you under their wing when you get there. And then also maybe say from an NGO or a nonprofit that's going to connect you with your research subjects. It just depends on your individual situation. But basically it's somebody who's going to provide some sort of support. Um, or it could be you know just from a university saying that okay, this person's going to enroll for some coursework, she's following the proper procedures, we'll have admission information, you know, in March or whenever. Um, or um, uh, permission to use an archive, that sort of thing. These can all be affiliations. Um, so in the C-Tools site, we actually have a, a good um, uh, document here that really breaks it down. How to make contacts, draft them, who to affiliate with, how to connect with people, what to say, et cetera, et cetera. So we have sample letters. Um, and actually, the, um, the sample letters that are on our C-Tools site, uh, 
you can actually poach those for text as you draft them. Um, we do recommend that you draft your own letters of affiliation. Like once you've been in contact with somebody in country and you kind of have them on the hook, <laughs> um, you can send some draft language to them that you've cobbled together and you know make sure you include everything you want to include. A lot of times they really appreciate that. They may make minor tweaks to it and prepare it and send it back. So um, definitely have a look at this uh, resource on C-Tools that kind of breaks down the steps to getting good affiliations. And do you submit affiliations with an application or after your application? Yeah, they go with your application. There's a, there's a place to, um, to include them. Um, but they are, you know, separate from your recommendation letters that come from, you know, your own associates here. Um, okay, just briefly, um, so we talked about award benefits. I wanted to mention, so on the topic of countries, um, go ahead and pull, I don't know one of these. Um, so for each individual country, you know, they're organized by region, um, but for instance, uh, I'll just pull up India, you can see how they have it broken out by the types of grants. Um, sometimes they have special names like Nehru. Um, they will have information about the grant itself, what's required, what's um, what they expect. Um, the candidate profile here is actually pretty skimpy. Um, other countries will have, uh, you know, quite a bit of information, but um, Make sure that you read through the country summaries with, you know, extreme attention to detail um, because depending on the country, um, you know, you want to make sure you're not barking up the wrong tree. In the end, you're trying to make sure that the country you choose is a good fit as much as anything else. Um, and if, you know, they really aren't accepting people from your field of study, for instance, then you're kind of barking up the wrong tree and, they're, you know, you don't need to waste your time. Um, let's see if this one has a better example of... Okay, so this is a little beefier, but um, solid foundation in their subject areas, ability to work, that's a little bit bland too. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not getting what I need here. I should have picked a different country. But um, in some cases, they'll say that they have a preference for grad students, or they might have a preference for undergrads, or they might have a preference for particular disciplines, um, or that they might exclude a particular, they might stipulate, hey, you know, open to all majors except business. That's China. I mean, it just depends. Point is, really, really dig into the country summaries. Make sure they fit. Make sure that it's what you're looking for. Um, yes? Could you speak a little bit more about like, a graduate student level, PhD level research? Oh, OK. Um, well, I mean, I'm sorry, what's that last About that, those kinds of applications. OK, well, um, certainly you expect, um, you know, for Grad students and especially you know PhD students who are you know, going to do um, that kind of advanced research, there there'll be some expectation that you're already pretty, you know, you've winnowed things down to a very specific research goal, that sort of thing. It needs to be well developed. It needs to, um, you know, uh, when you put it forth in your statement of grant purpose, um, you know, you need to have you know done the appropriate legwork in country, have it really um, down to a particular point, and really have everything. Um, organized and demonstrated as such in your application. As far as, um, you know, uh, like historical background for your research and kind of, uh, you know, introducing it, that's not as important for the application itself as focusing on the nine to ten month project that you're planning to do um, in country. So you'll talk about um, uh, you know, a number of different things and we have, we have some information on that too. Let me go ahead and pull this open while I'm here. Um, so under statements, um, aside from uh, samples, which you can read through, um, we actually have a uh, rubric that you can use just to you know, knock together a, a first draft. Um, OK, so some of this is just formatting and stuff, which they are pretty sticky about. So follow the formatting. Um, put your name on your paper, that sort of thing. Um, OK, so here's some of the, the meat. Answer their questions, um, obviously, that they list out on the Fulbright website, but really you need to paint a full picture of what you're planning to do. Um, you know, the people with whom you're going to work, why you're doing it, what's significant about it, um, a timeline and your methodology. If you're going to do work with human subjects, you need to include some language about your you know, planning to obtain IRB approval, that sort of thing. Um, where you're going to do it, why you chose that place, um, if there's anything that might be uh, uh, controversial or you know possibly politically sensitive, you need to you know in, how do I want to put it? You want to uh, 
not just assure the reviewers, but you want to make them believe that you'll handle it professionally and not you know, embarrass your host country, that sort of thing. Be very diplomatic in your language. Um, so certainly um, look through the rubric, um, use it to, and I can, you can see how I kind of talked about this. The, the first, the main thing that they consider though is the feasibility. Of, of what you're putting forth. And so all of these things fill in the picture. You're looking to develop as robust a picture of who you are as an applicant and why your project you know, holds water, why it uh, is important, and why you're doing it now, like in, in terms of your future plans, like why now, that sort of thing. All of these things kind of fill in the picture. And you have to do it in two pages. <laughs> so um, yeah, <laughs> it's two um, pages for research grants. <laughs> about IRB approval, if you're a senior now and you're planning to do full right after you graduate, you should try and get IRB approval even before you hear back from them because I didn't do that and it was very, very hard to find someone to do it afterwards. And the university mm -hmm. there, it's also, Goodness. you're not actually students, so it's also hard to be approved to your host university. So you should just do it in case you get the full right because otherwise you won't get it. It's very hard right. to get it. It's so if you want to research something and it has human subjects, so it's like an ethical approval of it, and it has to go through your university, and you have to be a student registered at the university in order to submit to the panel. So institutional Review Board. Okay. Um, and you can, we have a, a very helpful um, IRB office here. I mean, we have, most of the time you can, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, um, but it seems to be that, you know, they're pretty good about fielding questions and, and helping people. It might take a little bit of time, but my experience has been they've been I have a question. It might be obvious, but maybe um, there's something I don't know. How is Fulbright different than Peace Corps? Um, well, I mean, I'm not an expert on Peace Corps, just from the, from the get-go, but, um, you know, Fulbright is supposed to be um, an academic project um, in, in, at its heart. It is a, um, intended to be kind of a soft diplomacy program. I mean, it is a, a State Department program, or it's, you know, um, funded by the State Department. Um, so there is that aspect of it that it is a diplomacy program, but really it's about the project that you put together and to, you know, undertake research or study or, in some cases, English teaching. I think it's pretty different. Like, I got yeah. the Peace Guard to Rwanda as well okay. as the Fulbright, and I chose Fulbright because you have a lot more freedom. It's only a year as well, and it's like, sure, you have an English teaching assignment, but then you can just have your own life to do whatever you want in your free time and like, have friends, go out, whatever it is. Whereas in Peace Corps, your life is so much more controlled. You're most likely put in a rural area. You only get to like meet other Peace Corps people when you guys meet once a month in a major city. It's two years. Um, anyway, and also in Fulbright, like she said, it's kind of more diplomacy-related in Bahrain. All the full writers would be invited to like embassy parties or like the wife of the ambassador would have like get togethers and you'd be automatically invited. Any kind of social rights and political and diplomats from all over the world who are at embassies are in Bahrain in these parties and that just that doesn't happen with these folks. So um, I'm graduating this year mm -hmm. and I heard um, do you have to be affiliated with the university to apply for grants or do you, you mean do you have to be? No. Um, so you're not talking about do you have to be from U of M or not? You're talking about do you have to be affiliated overseas with somebody? Or uh, she? I think she means okay. do you have to be a student when you apply? Yeah. No, not necessarily. So um, certain other universities do it a little bit differently, but we actually advise and allow alumni to apply through us. So it's fine. Um, a little bit about the timeline and kind of you know strategizing for that. So right now um, and. Again, some of, you know, this is uh, in the timeline checklist. This is kind of included. Um, everything I'm going to say, you can go and look it up afterward. But um, the only real um, uh, hard rules about timing and eligibility is you have to have gotten your bachelor's degree by the time you start your grant. So you can apply as a rising senior this fall, right? Um, also, if you've gotten it in the past few years, that's fine, too. Um, if you're currently in the middle of doing stuff, that's fine. But you cannot have gotten your PhD um, at the time of application. So if you're going to get your PhD prior to um, the October deadline, then you wouldn't be eligible for this. You'd, you'd actually be eligible probably for another award, but not the U.S. student program. Um, so depending on where you are with things, um, are you, you've already graduated from U of M or you're... You will be. Okay, so you'll be fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, depending on, you can contact me or Kelly depending on what you want to apply for, but yes, yes, you're, you're eligible. Um, yeah. 
Um, so I know for the application you need to submit your transcript. Can you talk about what like the GPA cutoff is? And what there isn't one for Fulbright. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's hard to say exactly, you know, how they look at it, but they don't have a minimum GPA. Um, I would say that, you know, they are looking for a record of high academic achievement, but some of that is, um, you know, they look at what is going to come into play for what you're proposing to do. So if you have um, really excellent grades that apply directly to your field and what you're doing, but you maybe you have a bad grade in you know, one of those other classes that you have to take one of your requirements, that's not necessarily going to ding your application um, too much. Now if you have like a, um, say you had a, a semester of poor academic performance just owing to you know personal things or something that happened in your life that uh, um, kind of affected it, you can um, mention that in your application. There's actually, uh, of the two statements that you have to prepare for your application, you have your statement of grant purpose, which is concerned with what you're going to do, your project or your ETA position. But then you also have your personal statement. And that's where you kind of introduce yourself, your background, how you've come to this project. But it's also a place to deal with any like red flags like that. If you have something that might cause a question in your reviewers' minds, you can kind of tamp that down. Did you know? Um, one, if you've traveled abroad or worked abroad before, uh -huh. is that, do they give preference to people who have been abroad? You know, um, you know, as originally conceived, they were trying to get, you know, young graduates to go who maybe who had never gone abroad before. Um, they, okay, if you've had extensive time abroad, um, doing the same sort of thing that you're proposing to go do, that's a problem. Like if you've lived in a particular location overseas, you know, for three of the past four years and you're just applying to go back, that's going to be a problem. But I mean, if you, you know, if you spent the first 10 years of your life in the country and you moved here and became a citizen and then want to go back to pursue something, that's not anything that's a problem. If you've taken family trips to a country over the years, that's not a problem. Um, anything you've done in undergrad, it's so like if you had junior year abroad, that sort of thing. Not a problem. They don't really consider anything that's done bachelor's level to, to come into play. So in most cases, no. There's nothing that would, would cause a problem. And as far as if you're at an advantage or not, in some cases, um, you might be if you've picked up the language in a location. It might, um, you know, aid your application. But they're also not going to sink you if you have been, been abroad. So the answer is both. We'll take both ones. And then I was just wondering, Um, so the arts grants, um, the application process is very similar to the academic grant. Um, as are you know some you know certain part of the application is the same sort of pieces. But then um, arts grants, you have to choose your field like you do with anything, and um, you have to provide a, um, supplementary materials that are specific uh, to the particular background or your particular field. Um, hang on, just briefly. Uh, so this includes architecture, by the way, um, if it matters, but, uh, so under supplementary materials, arts applicants have to do supplementary materials. You can go and look at the list. They have it broken down by the field of study. And so some of them are pretty um, brief. Okay, digital portfolio, maximum of 20, there you go. Um, but if you go to music, it's like, wow, it's really <laughs> broken down by the type of, by the, you know, by the instrument, if you're a voice um, applicant and you, uh, you know, they, they may invite you to come and audition for them in person, and they will if you're going to ultimately be successful. But anyway, um, that's really the really material that's different, is the supplement and material. And there are specific rights of each arts thing, so you have to look for them. Yeah, so that, let me hold on to that, that's and, I'll, and I'll, I'll get there, because um, let me talk briefly about the timeline, and I'll get there okay. with that. Um, so... The timeline. Uh, so right now, it's when you're developing your applications and preparing everything. The U of M campus deadline is September 8th. Now this is different than what you may have seen um, for the national deadline, the published national deadline in October. The reason universities have an earlier deadline is that we pull together interview committees for our applicants who get their applications in by the campus deadline. Um, and so it takes some time to do that. We have to actually have, you know, mostly complete applications to give them to review. Um, and so if you get everything in by the campus deadline, we will 
find a time to interview you and you'll have a chance to meet with um, two or three faculty and in some cases staff with um, expertise that's either related to the country or your field of study, hopefully. Um, and they will sit down with you. Um, they don't make any cuts. We don't cut anybody. If you apply through U of M, it goes to the national competition. Um, they will sit down and talk to you about um, your application materials. You can solicit their feedback on them. And then you'll actually have a little bit of time to incorporate some of that feedback and kind of polish up, uh, give your application a final polish before you push the real submit button. Um, those uh, interviews take place mid-September to mid-October, roughly. Um, when you meet with them, uh, the other benefit of doing the interview besides the feedback that you might receive uh, is that there's a, an evaluation form that accompanies your application. Now, this has changed in recent years. There's no longer a rating on the application form. Um, it's simply meant to um, uh, capture some of the committee's impressions of you as you came across in person, because this is the only time you're going to actually sit down and talk to somebody face to face. Um, so ideally, it will add another facet to your application and kind of um, help further along when people are actually making a decision about your application. So there, there are some benefits to doing the interviews. Um, and so if you want to do that, and we suggest everybody does, um, you need to get it in by September 8th with the understanding you'll have more time to make edits and do a final polishing. It's, you're not saying goodbye to it forever if you apply by the campus deadline. Um, so once the interviews are done, you've made final polishes, and you submit, and it goes to the national competition by, I think, October 13th is the national deadline this year, um, it then goes to the National Screening Committee here in the US. The National Screening Committees um, for academic and ETA are organized by country or by region. So the people at that level are not necessarily going to be from your field. Um, so this, there are a few things this impacts. Um, one of the main things is, is when you are preparing your statements of grant purpose and anything in your application, keep in mind it's, it's going to be potentially non-specialists reading it and selecting. So um, make it accessible. Um, you don't want to get bogged down in too much disciplinary jargon, that sort of thing. Um, you need to write for educated non-specialists. For arts applicants, this is where it's different. It is organized by your field. And so they will be professionals in your field, and it's um, uh, necessary to uh, kind of think of it in those terms. Um, so that's, that's kind of where the, the main difference occurs. Um, so the National Screening Committees meet mid-November to mid-December. And um, they will go through. They will make a first cut. And then they send their list of finalists for each individual country or region to the in-country commissions, or the, in some cases, regional Fulbright commissions. And they will let you know uh, sometime in January if you've made that first cut, if you're a finalist. And if, uh, you know, if you don't make the first cut, then you're welcome to apply you know, in uh, subsequent years. But um, if you do make the first cut and you're a finalist, it goes to the in-country commissions or the regional commissions. And they will deliberate and get back to you in spring, basically. Um, it can vary. It can be as early as late March, and but it kind of goes on from there. Uh, most of them come in in April, um, in some cases early May. There are a few stragglers sometimes that, that go into the summer, but they try to get them uh, back sometime earlier in the spring. So it's not the best timeline for those of you applying to grad school and other opportunities, but there's not really anything we can do about it. At that point, we're kind of in the same boat with you. So um, let's see. Uh, at that point, they will contact you directly. Um, Fulbright headquarters in New York, IIE, the Institute for International Education, is the nonprofit that administers the um, program on behalf of the Department of State. Um, you'll get an email directly from them, uh, you know, saying if you've been offered a grant, been designated as an alternate, or not selected. So at that point, you have to make a decision. Uh, if you're offered something, you have to make a decision, yes or no. You can't defer one, so. Um, you might be able to change the date that you start, but you can't defer. Um, okay, I feel like I'm jumping around a bit, but um, yeah. If you don't get something, uh -huh. can you reapply? Yes. Can you reapply the same project, but no You can absolutely reapply however you want to. There's no prejudice um, about you know, previous applicants. And in fact, we've had people apply year after year, and like third time they've gotten it. And sometimes with a barely tweaked application. Sometimes it's just, you know, it is a bit of a crapshoot, and it's extremely competitive. 
and you know, just the variance in the pool between years can be all the difference. It just really depends. It depends on who, you know, who was vetting the applications that year in some cases. So, oh boy, a lot of hands went up on that. Uh-oh. <laughs> yes. Um, like with this is kind of going back to, to an earlier question about the experience you have in country. In, in my case, I would be applying for a research grant, and I, I'm a uh -huh. PhD student. Okay. So in that case... In your experience, would you recommend, like, for example, I have a lot of experience in the country I'm, I'm mm -hmm. intending to apply for, or mm -hmm. maybe something on a different country, or how yeah. would that play into... It, I would... I think that we'd want to talk to you on, on you know, your specific case. You might want to consider applying for a Fulbright-Hayes if it's for dissertation research. Um, the Fulbright-Hayes is, is specifically for that. And so it's kind of to address that problem of, I have all this experience in country, you know, can, you, know you might not really be as competitive for the U.S. student program. Um, but do, do get in contact. Um, let me give you this before people start uh, disappearing. Um, let's see home. Okay, so on the Fulbright Resources site, the main page here. Um, so Kelly Packins uh, advises for academic grants. We actually have all of our appointment schedule online, so you can just go in and find a time that works for you. Um, we'll meet with you in person. We'll talk to you on the phone. We'll do Gchat. We don't care. However, it's convenient for you to meet with us. It's not a problem. Um, but she can also talk to you about your options specific uh, to your level and, you know, kind of what the landscape is for your country, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll leave this. I just yeah. want to say yeah. that you can also see the stats of how many people yeah. tied to the country the year before. Yep. So if you want to see if it's like a super competitive place or not, and a lot of them, there, you go. there are very few applicants. Like I think Swaziland had like five people apply last year. There's some of them that's pretty low. So if you're just really trying to get any full rate, you can choose some kind of them think about it. Taylor. So that she makes a very good point. So the statistics. Um, up here in the top right um, on the Fulbright page, not our C tools page. Um, you can pull it up by the type of grant and country. So you can see the trends, kind of what it's looked like, how many people have applied versus how many awards were given. So, but a word, just a note, um, one caveat about this. Everybody sees these, these figures. So. It's possible, like for instance, if nobody applied one year, um, well, let's see, so people apply but no awards are getting for you. Okay. Um, um, good question. I don't think it's been determined yet. It's no specific year. number. Yeah, no spe it's, it's a regional committee. Um, so they may not have given any for that year. And you can see that sometimes they didn't give it even though somebody applied. So they're not just going to try and fill it with anybody. If it's not a quality application, they're not, you know, they're not just going to plug somebody in. Um, but do keep in mind that everybody sees these, and sometimes it'll cause a bump in the number of applications for a particular country. If, if it looks like it was under-applied to one year, it might get a corresponding bump the next year. Um, really, um, take it into consideration um, but take it with a grain of salt. Don't let it determine the country you choose. It really should be more about the fit with what you want to do and what you bring to the equation. Um, so you can let it factor into it. But, you know, you don't want to make the decision for you exactly. Um, but, yeah, the statistics are available for all the types of grants and the regions, so you can kind of go through it. Um, but final, before everybody disappears, um, do uh, join the C-Tool site. Um, even if you don't wind up applying, you can at least go through and, and have access to the resources. You can also um, make, you know, make appointments with us uh, just on the main home page. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't add you all uh, individually, but that's, that's kind of what we had today. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we're here, <laughs> we're here. Um, and we update our appointment schedules. Um, Right now we're kind of at a busy period with some other things we're working on, but we anticipate having more uh, time available. So we, if it looks like maybe there isn't some time that works for you, maybe check back in a few days. We might have some more times added to our calendar. Um, and you can just go, choose them, indicate, you know, your field, whatever, and um, how you want to meet in person by phone or Gchat. And we are happy to meet with all of you individually and talk about your specific uh, situation. So thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Karen.